It's great to see you all here on this beautiful spring morning on this, uh, for this very, very exciting uh, symposium. I'm Ed Gallagher. I am uh, the president of the American Scandinavian Foundation, and it is my very great pleasure and honor to welcome you to our headquarters, Scandinavia House, the Nordic Center in America, for this morning's symposium, The Future of the Icelandic Language, renamed The Day of Icelandic, uh, Icelandic Language, which has been organized by the Icelandic American Chamber of Commerce in cooperation with the American Scandinavian Foundation. We are especially honored to have with us this morning His Excellency President Gudni Johannesson and First Lady Eliza Reid uh, here at Scandinavia House to participate in the symposium. And I'm delighted to welcome the many distinguished speakers who are with us also. A full morning has been planned with a great variety of viewpoints and presentations. This morning's discussions coincide with the celebration of the centenary of Iceland's independence and sovereignty. And we will be further celebrating that event later this evening at the annual ASF Spring Gala taking place at the Metropolitan Club. Tickets still available for anyone who would like to come. For those of you unfamiliar with the ASF, it is worth mentioning that since its incorporation in New York City in 1911, ASF has served as the leading cultural and educational link between the United States and Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. Established by Danish-American industrialist Niels Poulsen and a group of other forward-thinking leaders from business and education, ASF was the first international non-governmental society to have as its sole purpose the development of goodwill through educational, professional, and cultural exchange. Particularly noteworthy with regard to today's proceedings, ASF has over the past 107 years provided several million dollars to both American and Icelandic scholars, students and artists for study and work both in Iceland and the US. Also of special interest, in the first 75 years of our existence, ASF made possible the translation and publication of numerous uh, works of Icelandic literature. And over the past 25 years, we also have had an active translation prize which has made it possible for, which has recognized the efforts of many Icelandic <coughs> translators. Also in the past 20 years, since we opened Scandinavia House, we have presented scores of Icelandic films and literary events, as well as exhibitions, lectures, and concerts. I'd like to thank everyone at the Icelandic American Chamber of Commerce and the Icelandic Consulate for their hard work in putting together today's symposium. And most especially, I'd like to thank Lener Gudjonsson, who has been the moving force behind all of this. I'd now like to turn the podium over to Jon Sigurdsson, the President and Chief Executive of OSER and Chairman of the Icelandic American Chamber of Commerce and also Corporate Chair of this evening's gala. Jon has been the CEO of OSER since 1996 and has held a number of other corporate positions as well as being Commercial Counselor for the Icelandic Trade Council back in the 1980s. He uh, currently has, is the Chair of I he sits on the board of Vitro Life AB and the Icelandic American Chamber of Commerce. He's had his American experience when he received a BA at the Uni United States International University in San Diego. And before that, he received a bachelor degree in industrial engineering for the Odense Technical College in Denmark. Please welcome Jon Sigurdsson. Thank you, Ed. It's very nice. To, to see all this crowd here, the, and the President Guðni, First Lady Elasa, distinguished guest, very, uh, you, uh, a heart of welcome. In 2018, Iceland celebrated this 100, 100 years of uh, self-governing, uh, as a self-governing country. In, in 1918, Iceland and Denmark signed a union treaty marking the start of the home rule for Iceland. Uh, this was the culmination of an, uh, a nearly a century-long campaign for Iceland self-determination. De 2018 will be a continued celebrating of this important event from Iceland, and this is a, a one uh, cornerstone of that celebration. We at the Icelandic American Chamber of Commerce contemplated, uh, of course, uh, how we could celebrate the centenary in the big, flashy way, and came up with three ideas. The first one was, of course, to qualify for the World Cup. <laughs> the, that, that was, uh, and we also decided that we will beat Argentina uh, in next month. So, so that's, so so that's checked. That's checked. So so, uh, 
others will have to take care of the other games. We are only taking care of one. Uh, and we would start to f a fund to support Icelandic startups that come to New York to join the Cultural and Creative Industry Accelerator and Nordic Innovation House in New York. So we have checked that as well. Very proud of that. And, uh, and thirdly, last but not least, we would celebrate what would make us Icelandic, our, uh, and which is our language. That's definitely. And uh, here we are today. So that's checked as well. <laughs> we are extremely honored to have the president of Iceland, Guðni Tjó Johannesson, and the first lady of Iceland, Elisa Reid. Uh, here with us today and uh, on their actually first official visit, isn't it, to New York City, yes. Um, the president studied history and political science at Warwick University in England and finished uh, there his uh, bachelor. He studied German at Bonn University and Russian at the University of Iceland and graduated with a master's degree in history from there. He studied at Oxford University in England and graduated with master's degree in history and com completed his PhD in history from Queen Mary University of London 2003. Uh, before uh, taking office as a president, Guðni was professor of history at the University of Iceland and taught at the University of London. Uh, Guðni has written numerous books on various issues as well as numerous academic papers and newspapers paper articles. In short, Guðni is the best president we could have uh, and ever wish for, and uh, probably the best in the world. They say it in the, the, the it's, it's, it said that the Kalsberg said it's probably the best beer in the world. So it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm and, um, but I might be a little partial here, I don't know. It's both uh, a privilege and great honor to uh, introduce the president of Iceland. Guðni. <laughs> Thank you, Jon. I heard that when I was waiting inside. And good morning, everyone. Golan Tayin. I would also uh, like to uh, uh, thank everyone involved in preparing this uh, meeting, this symposium on the future of the Icelandic language. But we have no time to waste. So I'm going to start with my speech, and then we will have a wonderful, rich, fruitful discussion on the Icelandic language and how we are going to make sure that it thrives and prospers in the 21st century. And I look forward to the dinner tonight. So, dear guests, kæru vinir. According to written sources, the saga of the Greenlanders and the saga of Eric the Red, it was over a thousand years ago that Norse or Icelandic words were first spoken on this great continent we now know as North America. Archaeological remains have since confirmed these testimonies. What we do not know, however, is what the voyagers from Iceland and Greenland actually said on this historic occasion. It is tempting to guess that when they had land in sight, somebody on the vessel, the Knurr, exclaimed, Ek sé land! I see land. But we cannot prove it. <laughs> the Norse and Torash uh, then built camp, they hunted, they encountered and had skirmishes with the indigenous peoples, but then they left for good. There was no permanent Norse settlement. In the first half of the 20th century, the Icelandic scholar and writer Sigurður Nordal speculated what might have happened if they had persevered. It was not totally unthinkable, Nordal wrote, that the Norse adventurers could ultimately have had the upper hand in conflicts with local tribes. They would then begin to farm the land 
And gradually, more people would arrive from Greenland and Iceland and Norway. The foothold would last. Leivur Eriksson, Guðríður Þorbjarnardóttir, Þorfinnur Karlsefni, Þórdís Eiriksdóttir and others who ventured into the uncharted waters to the west of Greenland would not return. Guðríður did give birth to Snorri Thorfinnsson in the New World, the sagas say. But then, then we would later have had Thórdís Snorra dóttir and Thorfinnur Snorrason and so on and so forth. The settlement of Vinland, the good land of the wine, would succeed. And as Sigurður Nordal concluded in his thought experiment, the Norse language would also survive on this vast continent. At the start of this millennium, the popular thinker Jared Diamond wondered in the same vein as Nordal did. What if the Norse had stayed here? In that case, Diamond wrote in his bestseller, Collapse, Vinland might have undergone a population explosion. The Norse might have spread over North America. And I, as a 20th century American, might now be writing this book in an old Norse-based language, like modern Icelandic or Faroese, rather than in English. Þetta gerðist ekki. <laughs> this did not happen. History took another turn. English became the predominant tongue on this vast continent. Furthermore, it is now the only language in the world that is truly global. But let us not forget that it has its Norse flavor. Before and around the time of the voyages to North America, Vikings were busy raiding the British Isles, leaving their indelible mark on Old English. I might now be writing this book, Diamond wrote. Ég mætti nú rita þessa bók we can say in modern Icelandic. And Guðríðu Þorbjörnadóttir and Leifur Eriksson could have used the very same words. So little has my mother tongue changed over the centuries. English, this fluid and flexible language, has also adopted Icelandic words and expressions. In English, a geyser erupts and people can go berserk. Now, I understand that this is of no concern to protagonists of the English language or native English speakers in general. Conversely, in Iceland, we are increasingly concerned with the incessant and increasing influence of English on the Icelandic language. Just like it is impossible to determine which Norse word was first uttered in this part of the world, we will never know which Icelander it was who first used English slang instead of perfectly good and proper Icelandic words. <laughs> Nor do we know for sure when that might have happened. A smart guess, however, would be that such events occurred with ever greater intensity after the occupation of Iceland by the British forces in 1940 and then the arrival of US forces in uh, the following year. At that time, Icelandic intellectuals quickly complained about English words corrupting the ancient and pure Icelandic language. The struggle had begun, and then other invasions uh, ensued. Rock and roll on television, including radio and TV stations at the US military base at Keflavik, and at stake was not only the purity of the Icelandic language, it was felt, but ho the whole of Icelandic culture. Examples of worries and indignation abound. In 1981, the Board of Icelandic State Television, the only service which reached the whole country, gave in to popular pressure and agreed by the narrowest of margins to approve the broadcast of Dallas, the popular soap <laughs> opera. The public was pleased, 
don't tell anyone, I was pleased. <laughs> but if readers' letters in Icelandic newspapers are to be believed, some people foresaw the end of Icelandic culture, the end of Icelandic nationhood. Now, what would they think now? In today's world, we have countless TV stations instead of the single linear state broadcaster. We have the internet and we have mobile phones. We give a like on Facebook, and when we conduct searches, we do not necessarily use the verb later, but rather the newfangled gugla. <laughs> I won't have to translate that for you English speakers in the audience. And we have computer games. The latest craze, as my wife Eliza and I know perfectly well, uh, parents of uh, four young children, uh, my oldest daughter Ruth does not play Fortnite, I think, but, but the other four do. Or they, the youngest ones observe it, the older ones play it. Fortnite, popular pastime of youngsters in Iceland today. And when they enter that virtual world, they talk about ad joina, to join but not the proper Icelandic expression, taka thaut. <laughs> they decide to battle, i.e. to join battle, but not berjast, as you would say in Icelandic. They search for a grenade, not a handspringa, and they enter the safe zone, not örugt svæði, or even the old word vébönd, used, for instance, to denote the weaponless uh, land around the old uh, legal assemblies, the thing. No, they use this these mixture of English and Icelandic, or just pure English. And the intrusiveness of English does not only occur through individual words or expressions. The whole structure of the language is giving in. Sentences are often filled with nouns, instead of verbs, which is more in line with Icelandic conventions. And adolescents, in particular, use oversimplified conjugations. One linguist has predicted that in a generation or so, the accusative will have vanished almost completely. Conversely, dativitis, the incorrect use of the dative case, has become an ep epidemic. And we use sort of an epidemic sounding name, dativitis. Also, the subjunctive has come under threat, and apparently the vocabulary, the vocabulary of many teenagers is minuscule. Uh, recently, one teacher lamented that smart high school students did not know what simple words like umburðarlindi or beinlínis meant, tolerance, and exactly in the English language. And in academia, another subsection of society, the emphasis on international publications and the welcome inflow of international students has weakened the status of Icelandic. Yes, the relative isolation of Iceland and its inhabitants has vanished. In 1968, half a century ago, when I was born, some 40,000 tourists visited Iceland each year. Last year, we had over two million visitors. Very few of these guests speak any Icelandic. Thus, there is no flugleiðir anymore. But Iceland there. No flugfélag Íslands, but Air Iceland Connect. And the hotel names Loftleiðir, Saga and Asia are gone, replaced with international brand names. And often, restaurants and other establishments have English names, not Icelandic ones. Now, furthermore, in this millennium, Icelandic society has undergone drastic changes. Today, more than 10% of all inhabitants in Iceland are either foreign-born or their parents were born abroad. Some of these new citizens speak perfect Icelandic. Others can make themselves understood, but lack comprehensive vocabulary and mastery of grammar. Many workers are not necessarily intent on staying in the country for good, so they see no reason to learn Icelandic. For instance, a fair number of foreign veterinarians now work in Iceland and communicate in English or other languages. Earlier this week, 
the parliamentary ombudsman censured the Icelandic Food and Veterinary Authority for hiring vets who do not speak Icelandic. But they got the reply that it was impossible to find enough qualified Icelanders or persons with a rudimentary grasp of Icelandic to fill the necessary positions. On construction sites, in fish factories, in hotels and restaurants, hospitals, a multitude of foreign languages can be heard, not necessarily Icelandic. Society is changing, and what will the future hold in store for us? In a sense, the future has already arrived. The world of voice command or voice recognition has arrived. Hey Siri, hey Alexa, Cortana can be heard in Iceland with questions or commands following the start of a conversation with your mobile phone or other devices. But in this new world, the gadgets do not understand Icelandic. Where is my phone? Segðu mér Sigríður. Will do nothing. Hvað segirðu Haraldur? No way. Is this perhaps the gravest threat that the Icelandic language has ever faced? On the global stage, the best known advocate of the Icelandic language is almost certainly one of my predecessors, Vigdís Finnbogadóttir. As president, Vigdís constantly wanted to protect and cultivate our beloved language. After her tenure, she has served as the UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Languages and spoken of the need to make Icelandic available in the digital world. Otherwise, it will end in the Latin bin, Vigdís has warned. Others have raised similar concerns. The most pessimistic persons foresee that Icelandic will simply not survive this latest intrusion. That after a few decades, Icelandic will at best coexist next to English. Useless in daily life, stagnant, languid, and antiquated. Dear friends, in a while, the panelists in this symposium on the future of the Icelandic language will discuss this threat, this apocalyptic vision, the possible death of a language. I will conclude here by a few thoughts about how we Icelanders can keep our mother tongue alive and well in the modern age. First of all, the battle is not lost. We just need to soldier on. Not battle or join us but continue to counter-attack and fend off intrusions. Sigurður Nordal, the writer who imagined the prevalence of Norse in the New World, invented the word tölva for computer, the combination of tala, number, and völva, soothsayer. What a perfect and brilliant word that is. Tölva, number, soothsayer. Speakers of Icelandic never use the word computer in Icelandic. They have this brilliant translation. We can do this. Also, we must make sure that we teach Icelandic in a satisfactory manner. We must encourage the publication of books in Icelandic, the making of movies in Icelandic, the creation of computer games in Icelandic. The market is there. Furthermore, we must guard the teaching of foreign languages to Icelandic school children. Start at an earlier age, even. At the same time, we must make sure that Icelandic is the main language of use in Icelandic universities. And this is of vital importance. We must improve the teaching of Icelandic to new residents from abroad and have it affordable. We must be helpful and tolerant. We must accept and understand that those who are learning the language as adults may make mistakes and speak with a heavy accent. Like, I would call myself pretty good at Icelandic, pardon the, you know, boasting as it were. But, you know, in this speech, I have struggled twice to pronounce vocabulary. I had to practice it because somehow it just always, I always get it wrong. Or few minutes before I gave this talk, I luckily asked Eliza, how do you pronounce entourage? Entourage. 
we do not know this. I am not, this is not my native language. I have to learn this. I hope you forgive me. You would have forgiven me if I had said and encourage. But maybe you would have th had to have thought for a while, what on earth is he saying? <laughs> we must be tolerant and understanding. Last year, some people criticized a foreign-born member of parliament in Iceland for not speaking flawless Icelandic. Fortunately, she received wide support. And my Icelandic Canadian wife, Eliza, was among those who came to her defense. I speak with an accent, Eliza pointed out, decline words incorrectly, and sometimes say pure nonsense. Uh, believe me, yes. <laughs> sometimes say pure nonsense, which makes people laugh, or they do not understand a thing until I have explained myself again. I'll, I won't give any examples, but believe me. <laughs> but that is okay. A modern, inclusive, and compassionate society needs considerate speakers and listeners. Therefore, we must also accept the presence of English as the language of communication, international education, and entertainment in a globalized world. In that spirit, we have to accept some foreign words like we have always done. The verb gugla is fine, as long as it declines the Icelandic way. Gugla, guglaði, guglav. The word like is fine. It's a nice neuter noun like lak or rik. There's nothing wrong with it. Likewise, while we must be accommodating towards the tourists who visit Iceland, we should not show some silly subservience. Our visitors come for exotic and unique Iceland. Why should they fear strange or incomprehensible words like Eyjafjalla jökull, or veitingastaður, or krá, or hundslappa drífa. We should have the self-confidence to give our establishments and companies Icelandic names. Veitingastaður and krá means restaurant and pub, respectively. Hundslappa drífa, what a wonderful word that is. Hundslappa drífa. Is a bit more difficult to translate though. Literally, the description of snowflakes as large as a dog's paw. <laughs> or snow gently falling down from the heavens in calm weather. And Eyjafjalla Jökull, I say it again, Eyjafjalla Jökull is the name of the volcano which erupted in 2010, halting flight traffic for days or weeks in the Western Hemisphere. It literally means the mountainous glacier by the islands. One US TV presenter famously threw his hands up in the air when the eruption was hot news and exclaimed that here was one unpronounceable name. And henceforth, he would call it, well, he said, I cannot pronounce this. Hey, 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 hey. I'm just going to call it, I forgot my yogurt. But we, we in Iceland, we will not give up. <laughs> if we do all this, if we do all the positive things I have mentioned, if we adopt this approach, we are on the right track. But still, everything depends on one thing. We must get Icelandic into our mobile phones and our cars, our refrigerators and our toasters. We must be able to speak Icelandic to all the gadgets of the world. In the 19th and 20th centuries, we fought for our independence in the actual world. In this new millennium, our existence as an independent nation depends heavily on the healthy survival of the Icelandic language. If we lose the language, we lose our identity. If we lose the language, we lose the link to past generations. We lose the link to our literature and our cultural heritage. We lose, and you lose. Tölum Íslensku, gott fólk. Icelandic tales, good folks. Thank you very much for listening.
thank you very much for a very, very interesting and, uh, and, and, and good uh, contribution here. Uh, we, have a, we have time for a few questions. So I would like you to state your name and affiliation and, and uh, uh, so go ahead. If, does anyone have a question? to say um, and I can categorically agree with you because since in Irish independence from Britain the, uh, re the resuscitation of the Irish language has effectively failed and it's been hit very hard by modern media and telecommunication systems however I'm wondering have you talked to Israel because Israel since independence in 1948 has been extremely successful at reintegrating Hebrew as a common daily spoken language and have you discussed with your Israeli counterparts how they've succeeded in resuscitating their language where Ireland has effectively failed? Uh, I am not the expert on this, but I'm sure that uh, uh, those who uh, have uh, uh, been in this business, as it were, will almost certainly have learned of the Israeli experience. But as, a, as, a, as an amateur, I uh, know that we in Iceland uh, keep one eye on what happened in the British Isles. You mentioned Ireland, uh, other Gaelic languages uh, did not survive. And uh, whilst the Republic of Ireland is, a, is an independent state uh, now, uh, there is a resentment there, I should think, or I guess uh, that uh, the language is no longer the the healthy means of communication, it should be. So there is a warning there. Uh, I also think that uh, we should, I hope you have not gotten the feeling that all is lost, because that was not the message I wanted to convey. We, it's in our hands, it is in our minds. And uh, we can use the example of, of Ireland as a, as, a, as a warning maybe, but we can also see that in Ireland, you know, even though people lost the language, they have a healthy, vibrant society if they, if they so wish. Uh, but the Israeli example is not uh, something I can actually contribute anything on because I just don't know enough about it. But the examples in the outside world, they are there for us to see. Yes. And Thank you very much for your speech. Um, my name is Tor Torres. I'm an Icelandic descendant and broker. And um, I just wanted to just wanted to tell you that the, uh, the room in which I have heard the most Icelandic recently uh, in New York uh, was a, a Wardruna concert uh, at Town Hall. And um, I don't know, I think, I think uh, that band and Einar Selvik um, deserves a lot of credit for, for bringing uh, Old Norse or Icelandic to, to the world. And um, I guess the related question is, um, uh, they kind of make it cool to yes. listen to Icelandic, so. Yeah, with, with all respect to the academics, the future of the Icelandic language is not in their hands. It is rather in the hands of rock stars. It is rather in the hands of uh, uh, makers of computer games or, or, or movie directors. We have other examples. One of my favorite bands is Skálmöld, a heavy metal band. <laughs> they use the Norse mythology in their, in their, in their, in their verses uh, and mix it with foreign influences, heavy metal. Bippi Mortens, one of Iceland's most uh, uh, popular singers, uh, sing, uses Icelandic. Uh, Icelandic hip-hop, Icelandic rap stars, more often than not, rap in Icelandic. They have some grammatical mistakes. <laughs> if the president had the authority to uh, uh, ban songs with grammatical errors, no, I'm not going to go down there. 
the president wouldn't even do it. And I'm not talking about myself in the third person. I'm, you know, I'm just making a hypothetical image there. Uh, so, I mean, I think Icelandic is flourishing in this sense. You, the band you mentioned, Skalmöld, Bubbi Mortens, Stuðmenn, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, Icelandic reaches Icelanders in, in this subculture, as it were. But of course, we have others who also want to reach out to the outside world. We have Björk, for instance, but uh, Björk can also sing in Icelandic. And we can do two things. We can speak Icelandic, we can speak English. And the better we know English, I think the better we understand and know Icelandic. That's why I wanted to emphasize this as well. The future of the Icelandic language does not depend on decreasing the knowledge of other language, but rather increasing. Uh, so uh, again, you know, it's a good point you made, Thor, that uh, the Icelandic level of Icelandic spoken here in New York was at a maximum when a, when a heavy metal band came into town. Hello, yes, yes. my name is Richard Jepson, and uh, I'm head of communication at Valenius Willemsen, so S Swedish Norwegian company, and uh, of course uh, interested in languages as a way of communicating. I noticed you used a Swedish word in your English speech, by the way, ombudsman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I've noticed uh, in the, uh, the recent years that so when we work together, the Swedes and Norwegians in our company, we speak like in a more adapted into a Scandinavian way of putting our words and, and the wording in sentences. I don't know if anyone recognizes that here. And I also noticed that a lot of young people that go to Norway to work, for example, in the, uh, in the, in the mountains in different capacities, they, they sort of speak a Scandinavian way. They, they adapt their language, the Swedish, into Norwegian. Do you have any thoughts about the Scandinavian yes, language? Yes, I, when I visit the Nordic, other Nordic countries, uh, I make a conscious effort to uh, speak in, uh, in uh, broken Scandinavian, as it were. Uh, and I fortunately managed to make myself understood. However, uh, we need to face the fact that times are changing. When I speak Scandinavian, I, more often than not, am restricted to saying what I can say, not what I want to say. I am limited. And then I am not at an equal footing with my colleagues from Norway, Sweden, Denmark. The knowledge of Denmark in Icelandic has decreased dramatically. It all started when we st started translating Donald Duck, Anders An. <laughs> I got the last, I'm mean, one of the last, you know, to read Anders An, Donald Duck in, in Danish. But then, you know, somebody got the great idea to start translating Donald Duck and ever since no Icelandic kid has ever been able to speak Danish. I am perfectly uh, happy with us speaking English in the Nordic Forum. I think it is fair. I think it is fair towards us, towards the Finns, towards the Greenlanders, the Faroese. And in any case, I know, I've been, you know, I'm an academic, I've been to so many Nordic conferences, and nobody understands the Danes. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier this month, Eliza and I were, at, were in Seattle. We visited Microsoft, and they are making good inroads. They are making so much progress in, in, in making uh, in, in simultaneous translation and all the rest of it, and in voice recognition. But correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Wilhelmur, who was there with me, Wilhelmur Thorstensen, who will later speak here, uh, or is with us here. Uh, I think the specialists at Microsoft said that, you know, voice recognition, artificial intelligence, everything is, in, is, everything is possible. There are no boundaries. Perhaps Danish, though, perhaps Danish. <laughs> so, but seriously, uh, in today's world, 
uh, English should be the means of communication in, in, in the Nordic world, in the Nordic exchanges. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. However, when a person in my position uh, representing Iceland in Nordic fora, uh, I am intent and I want to, and I think we as representatives of Iceland should make the effort to speak in Scandinavian when we visit the other Nordic countries, when we visit Denmark, Norway, Sweden. I mean, I did study Danish for 14 years or whatever it was. <laughs> and if I cannot make a five minute speech in that language, then that says something about either myself or the Icelandic education system. <laughs> so let's just hold you on there. You wanted to make a question there? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, we, uh, you know, I do not have at the top of my head. I guess I could Google that, how many <laughs> Hebrew speakers are, there are in this world, um, but I should be, I'm pretty sure that way more than speakers of Icelandic. So, so that's one limitation, I should think, or one thing to have in, have in mind. But also the fact that this has happened so fast. When I was growing up, I'm born in 68, like I mentioned, 1968. When I was growing up, there were no immigrants or hardly any immigrants in Iceland. This has happened so suddenly. So we are all of a sudden waking up to the reality that there are tens and thousands of people in Iceland who do not speak Icelandic or speak very broken Icelandic, but want to study the language, want to be part of the community in toto, which means being able to converse in Icelandic. So we have to catch up with this. I think the authorities are on this. Uh, I'm sure there are opportunities, pr private opportunities, uh, like there are some entrepreneurs out there. I do remember when I, Eliza and I lived in England, Eliza took English Icelandic courses uh, in London. So, so there are some, uh, some possibilities. Maybe there's a smart Icelandic entrepreneur in this room who thinks, aha, courses in Icelandic. There's a possibility there for us. So uh, the, like you mentioned, the market is out there. We just need to fulfill the needs. Um, so my name is uh, Carl, I'm the president of Emus Anti Technologies. We're a three-time Microsoft Worldwide Partner of the Year. I asked my wife to marry me in Iceland and we go for three weeks at least a year. Uh, you mentioned the number of items that we most certainly could help with and I think there are some bright people in this room that could do the same um, from a Microsoft perspective. Uh, I run multiple languages on my computer, and maybe you've already spoken to them about this, but it'll randomly switch to Icelandic, and mm. I'll forget what I'm typing <laughs> to someone, because all of a sudden when I see the items, I just start finishing the rest of my communication to someone, so maybe you've designed it that way, but <laughs> um, um, you know, um, Skype will do auto-translations. Those are add-ons for people who, like myself, use Skype for business. When I wake up early in the morning, and I go to Europe, or I'm up late at night, and I go to Asia, um, you know, the, I can use Skype and have it translate for me with subtitles at the bottom, much like Donald Duck used to do when you were younger. Um, have you spent, or is, any, is there any investment in time to, uh, on some of the translation components so that while someone like myself might not speak fluent Icelandic, at, at least if the translator is doing that for us, and we're seeing the subtitles below. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, the, this is the future, and this, is, this process has already started. Microsoft, for instance, and uh, we have Google Translate and so on and so forth. Uh, so we are getting there. It's not flawless. Uh, you can easily detect uh, mistakes, at least that is my experience when I do Google Translate, for instance that you, know, you cannot use this in legal contracts forever, for instance. <laughs> I wouldn't ask Google Translate to, 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 to be trusted there. 
but this is the future. We're working on that. The next step is the, is the voice recognition so that you can uh, say something in Icelandic and the person you are talking to or the gadget you are talking to will understand you by translation. Or that you can say something in, in English and it will come out in, in, through an Icelandic voice. Uh, our, I wouldn't call it our problem, but at issue is the fact that we are so few. This costs a lot. Uh, the cost is decreasing through advancement in technology, but there are only about 350 or 400,000 people in the world, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, who, who actually speak Icelandic. It's a miniature market, and that is our problem. Uh, Icelandic is, we often exaggerate. I know it's, Icelandic is a difficult language to, uh, to learn, but it's not, it's not one of the world's most difficult languages, believe me. You can pick a much harder language if you want to. Greenlandic, Finnish. So uh, we shouldn't exaggerate that. That is not the obstacle. Uh, if there is an obstacle, it is the fact that we're so few, and people will say, like, What's, is it worth it? Who's going to pay? And that is the question we are facing now. I think we need yeah? to... Uh, we need to... Uh, we need to progress here. Yes, of course, of course. Okay. But thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.